Good morning. So, my name is Michael. I work for Keenfolk. We are a small company from Berlin. Uh, we do mostly Linux software, and among uh, many other things, it's eBBF uh, today. Um, so the talk is uh, about GoBBF. It's a fairly new library uh, to work with eBBF programs from uh, Go, and uh, it aims to help you to uh, uh, access the eBBF subsystem from your uh, Go software. The talk is uh, basically two parts. It's the first part on eBBF in general. So what is it? How does it work? Um, the basic principles behind it. And in the second part, we are going to look into GoBBF, uh, which is uh, uh, also split into two parts, uh, depending on what your use case is. And uh, yeah, just see how it works in general. So eBPF is a so-called bytecode virtual machine in the Linux kernel. Um, today it's used for tracing, uh, networking, so software-defined networking, uh, for performance analysis, uh, for security purposes, uh, and so on. Um, the, the classic BPVF or the Berkeley packet filter is much older, so, so the uh, 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 the functionality to uh, use uh, to do use it for packet filtering has uh, been in the Linux kernel for a long time, and it's used by, for example, TCP dump. Um, um, the, in 1992, uh, there was no unified way, way to to filter network traffic, and uh, the BSD packet filter paper uh, brought uh, such a uh, system, uh, which then was uh, implemented for the Linux kernel as well. And today it's called Enhanced BPF uh, because it has grown a lot more functionality over the usual uh, packet filtering use case. Um, you can attach to kernel events. Uh, you can modify network packets, or to drop them, or to route them. Um, you can use it to do syscall filtering and uh, a lot more stuff. A nice property is uh, the, the safety guarantee you get uh, through the BPF verifier. So when you load your BPF program into the Linux kernel, um, it first gets verified because the kernel needs to make sure that uh, your program uh, isn't malicious, it doesn't uh, block uh, the kernel forever, and so on. So after your tool uh, gets through the verifier, you can be sure that there are no loops in there, that there is no invalid memory access, and so on. And uh, of course, you are running in the kernel, so it's uh, uh, very fast, and it's also JIT compiled on uh, some architectures. Um, so yeah, fast is a requirement to do, for example, networking. So it's good we have that. So uh, from a high-level perspective, it looks like this. In user space, you have uh, your uh, program. And uh, from there, you use the BPF syscall uh, or some library which uh, makes your life easier uh, to interact with the Linux kernel and uh, uh, load your program or your programs. You can have uh, many of them. Those live in uh, kernel space, of course. And then you have eBPF maps uh, to share data between uh, eBPF programs and to share data uh, between the eBPF program in kernel space and your uh, program uh, running in user space. So first, a couple of details on eBPF programs. Uh, they can be attached uh, to sockets. That is, again, the traditional use case. Um, um, so uh, if you want to execute some eBPF program whenever a packet arrives, uh, you uh, can use that feature. Uh, you can attach to uh, kernel trace points. Um, the Linux kernel uh, already does uh, define a lot of trace points, so you often uh, you can uh, just uh, 
look into what you want to trace. You can uh, check out the kernel source tree, see where the trace points are, uh, what, what is available there, and then maybe just attach to a trace point. If that uh, doesn't work for you, uh, cape ropes uh, maybe do. Uh, you can use kbrops to, to inject a, a program as a handler at a certain uh, address. So for example, if you want to uh, trace a, a syscall, a Linux syscall, you could use a kbrop which then uh, always triggers uh, when the syscall uh, is executed. And uh, there are uprobes, that's uh, basically the same as kprobes, the only difference is that uh, those are uh, for user space uh, uh, function calls, so if you want to trace something there, you uh, would use uh, uprobes. Then we have uh, maps. Um, uh, maps are the data structures to, to share data between a uh, kernel and user space. Uh, when you create a map, you can uh, say what uh, data uh, you want to put in there. So it's up to uh, you uh, uh, if you want to have an integer value in there and you only need to store one, you can create a map with uh, size one and uh, define that uh, key and value is of type integer, for example. And um, there's one uh, special, a special map, it's called um, uh, PROC array. And this is a sort of a lookup table in the eBPF system which uh, contains entries uh, to other um, BPF functions. Uh, so if you want to replace your currently running uh, eBPF program with another one, you could uh, look up uh, one there and uh, call it. Um, and you should be aware that uh, the main page for BPF is uh, rather out of date, so it's, uh, it can be pretty hard to, to get information uh, uh, on the available programs or map types, and you sh should uh, look into the source code. So I think right now uh, maybe four map types are in the main page, and in Linux 4.10 uh, are eight or ten map, ty map types, so it's uh, not super up to date. Um, yeah, that's uh, the, the list of existing maps right now. Uh, we have a hash which actually works like you would expect from a hash or a map uh, key value. We have an array and then we have uh, different uh, types uh, for uh, uh, special use cases. I will um, uh, show you one in detail and that is type uh, perf event array. So it's an array of file descriptors uh, with uh, perf event data um, and um, the nice thing about it is that the kernel can just write into a, a ring buffer and doesn't have to wait for you in user space and um, the user space program uh, can then map the memory of the ring buffer and uh, read from it asynchronously um, and uh, that's also a type of map that you often would use when you uh, use uh, kprobes uh, to trace something and uh, we will see that in uh, one example later. So to give you an idea how BPF looks like when you really write a BPF uh, assembly or pseudo assembly, I will uh, show you a, a short code snippet, but uh, you don't have, have usually have to do that. So that's a very small program you could uh, load into the kernel as is to uh, count uh, fjoin at uh, syscalls. Uh, so whenever the syscall gets called, it uh, increments the, the counter by one and exits. Um, and yeah, as you can see, it's, uh, it looks rather tricky and it's not very approachable. Uh, so fortunately, we don't have, that, uh, have to do that, but we can use uh, uh, tooling. Um, around uh, enhanced BPF and uh, uh, modern tracing uh, 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 tools on Linux, uh, there is the, the IOVisor project. Uh, you can find it on GitHub and also on IOVisor.org. So um, 
if you are into that and want to learn more about uh, the available tools, uh, find documentation and so on, that's a good place uh, to start. So now on uh, GoBPF, um, it's, uh, as I said before, a li library to uh, create, load, and use eBPF programs. And it's actually uh, two sub-packages. It's uh, one which allows you to use uh, CGO and the BPF uh, compiler collection, and a second package which allows you to uh, use pre-built um, ELF object files. And uh, we will have a quick look on both parts. Um, why go PPF? Uh, when we started working in that area, there was no library yet which uh, did uh, what we wanted to do. Uh, but we found the Hoover project um, uh, from IOVisor, which uh, wants to be a, uh, they call it data plane. So I think the idea is that you have a daemon on your system, and then uh, you ask the daemon via an API for uh, system data, and the, the program then loads, for example, some eBPF program to provide you with the, the necessary data. Um, and the uh, second reason is uh, we work on WeaveScope, which is a tool to do uh, uh, cluster monitoring, so for example, Kubernetes. And this is written in Go. And it also needs to um, gather a lot of data from uh, your system. So for example, running uh, processes, containers, network connections. And uh, right now, the, their approach is uh, to, to pass proc and uh, check the contract tables. Um, and uh, this is uh, rather difficult to do because uh, you have to scan a lot of data and that very fast. And um, when you have a lot of processes or a lot of containers, uh, it can be uh, tricky to do that reliable and fast. And yeah, uh, depending on the use case, it's much nicer to have eBPF there because uh, the kernel is doing um, a lot of work and uh, you just have to uh, read the events then. So when you use the BCC package from uh, GoPPF, uh, you can uh, write your program in, in C. It's a modified C language for BPF backend, so it feels like C. You have to uh, be careful about a, a couple of constraints because in the end, uh, uh, the um, BCC will build an eBPF tool out of it, and it has to pass the kernel verifier. Uh, but it makes things a lot easier. Um, you have a lot of helper functions. Uh, uh, interacting with a map uh, is uh, much more uh, comfortable than the assembly code we saw before, and so on. Um, LibCC, LibBCC actually is not only the library which helps you to, to write your program, but it's also a compiler. So the, it works like you, you pass it your program as source code. Either you read it from a file, or you just have it in your Go code in some constant, for example. And uh, then it uh, uh, translates your program into BPF bytecode. So uh, we can actually verify it, or uh, BCC verifies it that for you before it gets uh, passed to the kernel. And uh, BCC also provides you with a lot of headers. Uh, before, you often had uh, to import uh, kernel headers to have all the uh, necessary uh, definitions of for BPF um, and all that is in BCC. So it's really a nice uh, library and uh, you should check it out if you want. So I will show you a bit of source code. Um, this is a snippet from, uh, from uh, the example tool in the GoBPF uh, repository. And um, uh, as you can see here, we just define a a source uh, variable and uh, put our C code in there. Uh, two important things here. Uh, one is uh, we define a struct of type uh, Joan event, and uh, then we uh, define a, an array, and it's of type uh, perf event, as we saw before, where we are going to write those events. So uh, that's the map. Uh, uh, which we then can read from user space later. 
And uh, the go part uh, looks like this. Here we load the source code, then we get a reference on the table, then um, we get a reference um, as a perf map and we pass it a channel and uh, then we can read from the channel the events. So we have a, a loop, we just wait for data and whenever there is data we uh, print it. And in Go BBF BCC, uh, it looks like this. We open a perf buffer and we give it a callback uh, cookie. And uh, then we have a um, gateway function which takes the cookie, looks up uh, the, the handler data, and uh, sends back uh, the event data. So I will quickly show that to you. So here we have the, the um, example program, and since uh, you need root uh, permissions for the BPF syscall, I am root here. And um, when I now do some action here, you can see we get an event, and um, we get a correct reports on what was happening and also the return value. So I was not allowed to do the ses second operation permission denied, and here is the return value. Not zero. Yeah, so. Um, the second package in Go PPF is ELF, so if you don't want to translate your uh, program uh, before you actually use it, or if you cannot uh, ship the uh, BCC, libbcc on all your systems because uh, maybe it's too large and your containers should be uh, small and tiny. Then you could think about uh, using uh, pre-compiled object files. Um, this feature relies on ELF sections. Uh, so in Linux ELF files you have uh, sections. And uh, by defining uh, by setting uh, particular section names, so here, for example, k red probe for a return probe, um, we allow uh, Go PPF to detect from the ELF file how the contents uh, should be loaded. Um, if you are interested in that, you could have a look on the TCP tracer BPF package from Weaveworks. It's, uh, as the name says, a TCP tracer. And uh, we plan to use that in scope. Um, so it uh, does exactly that. It's a very uh, small C program. It gets compiled to an ELF object file, and we then later load it with Go PBF uh, to, to uh, trace uh, TCP connections. Um, yeah, you can create such object files with uh, Clang. Um, I think the BPF backend has been in the uh, static compiler for quite some while. So you um, first produce bitcode object file and feed that into the compiler. And uh, then by selecting um, architecture BPF, um, you uh, generate uh, the uh, BPF bytecode uh, for later use. Um, a nice or tricky feature of GoPPLF is that you can uh, create your program for uh, uh, multiple kernel versions. Um, usually you have to tell the kernel when you load a program for which uh, version it was written because the kernel will only accept a program which was written exactly for the version you are running. And uh, this can be tricky when you have uh, uh, patch release of the Linux kernel, you uh, maybe don't want to recompile your program. Um, so uh, we uh, built uh, in this uh, feature when you set it to this constant, we will try to guess uh, the, the current kernel version uh, during runtime and then just say to the kernel, yeah, we built it for that version. Um, you can do that. Um, it can be tricky because uh, sometimes kernel uh, structures uh, change, uh, functions change, so but depending on what you do in your eBBF program, it could break afterwards. So you, you should know what you can expect from the kernel or what you uh, rely on. And one last word, uh, continuous integration is also tricky. Um, 
you need root access, um, you need a modern kernel, you often don't have that, so if you uh, ever need to test Linux kernel features, have a look on stage one builder, on the stage one builder project, uh, with, here we use uh, Rocket for a custom, uh, um, we use Rocket with a custom stage one image, uh, which allows us to test any workloads on CI systems. And time is up, I believe, so that's it. Thanks. We have time uh, for question because Ron needs some time to uh, build up. Anyone having a question? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I have two questions. First, ooh, I don't. I didn't get the media behind using BBF in the context of tracing, as it's firstly used in networking, especially for filtering packets. So, what are the the new features that give it this good uh, reputation? Second, in the context of tracing, uh, what about its overhead compared to other tracing tools like Detras or System Tab, and how we can measure it? Thank you. Um, so. I think uh, I will start with uh, the second question. So I think the, the main uh, feature, uh, the, the main advantage here is that you now uh, can have it in mainline kernel. You don't need to need to have any extra modules. It's supported by upstream. Yeah, and um, um, regarding the first question, so. Uh, a, many, a lot of the functionality wasn't uh, possible before, so maybe you know Brendan Craig from Netflix, uh, who has uh, been doing this for a long time, and uh, uh, D-Trace from Solaris always was quite powerful uh, uh, to trace systems, and Linux uh, for a long time um, didn't give you the same features uh, to trace programs. Um, Regarding networking, uh, one feature from eBPF is a fast data path, XDP. Uh, it's used, for example, uh, by the Cilium project. Um, so they do container security and networking with eBPF, and this is something you couldn't do before. And, yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much.